Cool. All right. Yes. Yeah, so welcome, everybody. Um, as Liz said, my name is Megan. Going to be here just going through a very like, informal presentation, just talking about exploring data science. So I will skip my own intro slide because I just got the hype man to do it for me. But so what this evening is going to look like here's our agenda. So first, just talking about like what exactly is data science, talk about becoming a data scientist. So what, how do you go about learning what you need to, what are the, and what's the interview process typically like, things along that nature. Then I'll end with just conclusion with some high level summaries of what we covered. Um, and any questions that come up, like throughout the course of the presentation, you can feel free to throw those in the chat um, and I can, I'll answer those also at the end. Um, we'll have definitely have some time for that. So first of all, just gonna talk, talk about what exactly is data science. And from my years working, I've noticed that there are a lot of different companies that will define this in different ways. So one company, their data scientist might be somebody who's working mostly in Excel and building summary reports. Other companies I've seen data scientists who need to write like software engineering level code and all of this stuff. So it's going off of job descriptions. There's a lot of different things out there. But when I say data science and like what it means to be a data scientist, I mean that it's somebody who's using mathematical and statistical theory together with computer science to extract insights from data and inform business strategy. So my big role is to take all of that technical background that I know and use it to help other teams do their job better. Because say for example, a marketing team, it would be great for them to really understand the data in terms of what customers are say resonating with advertisements, but the people who are on the marketing team most likely can't build a model or do some sort of clustering to understand that. So at the end of the day, you're extracting those stories, that information from data um, using your skills. So in terms of what a typical day as a data scientist looks like, um, this is modeled off of my own experience and it's pretty universal, I'd say just across different jobs and companies. Um, in a typical day, I'll spend a lot of time just doing data cleaning and feature generation. So I think this is one of like a really big part of data science that's overlooked. It's not the super cool stuff where you can like drop words like machine learning and artificial intelligence. This is no literally your using usually like a language like SQL, which is a database querying language or some other tool to get your data to the point where it's like good enough to be in a model. So that will be looking at stuff like sometimes you'll get missing values or if you're doing data where you have like people can write in their own answers, you could get people that write, say the color purple, like seven different ways. Some will capitalize it, some won't. Like there's a lot that goes into just making sure your data is at a point that you can use it. Um, you'll also often have to do some like data aggregations. Maybe you're looking at like a minimum or a maximum or an average. Um, also joining tables with, joining different tables of data. So for example, like you might have one table that has information about a customer and it's like their age, their gender, all of that stuff. And then another table that has information about like customer purchases, for example, you might wanna join that table about some of that demographic stuff with their purchases to learn more about it. So I would say in a typical project that this like data wrangling, cleaning, whatever you wanna call it stage takes anywhere from 65 to 75 percent of the time that that whole project's going to take up. So again, this is something you'll get better at, but it is definitely like a big part of any project. And it's not just data science isn't just the super cool like 
how you see in the movies where there's five screens of people just like writing code and like this model just pops stuff out. Um, which moves me to my second point is like, I'll also write code to build models and algorithms um, usually. And um, for all the comp different companies I've worked for, that'll be either in Python or R languages. So um, a lot of this will, it's nice because in both of those languages, there's pre-written software that you can use to fit known models already. So it doesn't necessarily take a super long amount of time to write that code for the models and algorithms. It's more of figuring out like what model or algorithm is appropriate for a particular instance um, and comparing like trying different models, comparing their performance and see which one does better than the other. Um, so this process like Again, it's usually not a super long time to actually write the model code. It's more of picking the right one, comparing it, seeing what makes sense for your use case. Another big part and what I'll, to, in a typical day, I'll usually have at least one to two meetings with stakeholders. So myself, I've always worked on a data science team that helps other teams within my company. So for example, like the next slide I'll go into just a little bit more about who those partners are, but basically just people who aren't data scientists, but who can use the company data and our models to do their jobs better. So a lot of these meetings are understanding what are their goals, what, what is it that they wanna learn more about and get a sense of what we bring to the table and how we can help them do things better. And then lastly, I'll say, I'll usually also spend some time building either a presentation or a report. So it depends on the project that sometimes the project's considered done if we like write code that generates a regular report, for example, that goes to some of our other teams in the office. Um, that can just be like, for example, if you launch a new feature in a phone application and the team that launched it wants to understand who's using it, how often are they using it, that could be something where we would just look at the user interaction data, do some summary stuff and have that like sent to them weekly. Um, or like slide decks are also very big. I feel like you'll never get away from them, but like when you, so for some of the projects, it is more appropriate that you'll like create a deck summarizing what you did, what's important, and then present that to the people involved. So, um, that's also something that'll take up part of a day. And I'll say too, when I say typical day, it's not necessarily that I would be doing all four of these areas in a day. Like for example, when I first start a project, this like first data wrangling feature generation, like that's probably taking up most of my day just because if it's a data source I'm not familiar with, I need to check it to make sure there's no errors in the, how we're getting the data coming into us making sure I understand what outliers look like, all of that stuff. Um, and also just meeting with stakeholders to make sure I really understand what it is that they wanna learn, what would make a project seem successful. So a little bit more about the stakeholders. So a couple teams that a data scientist might work with. Again, this could depend a lot on the company. Um, some larger companies will have like a data science team that supports a specific area. So there might be like a marketing data science team and all they do is support the marketing team. Um, other companies, it's, you'll be working with a like a lot of different teams. Um, but again, that just depends on how the company's structured, where they are in terms of like the development of, the, of their data science team within the organization. So, just a couple teams. Um, so engineering. So when I say engineering team, those are the people who are writing code that are usually like actually creating whatever product it is that your company does. So for example, like think of like a phone application. Um, there'll be engineers who are called front engineer, front end engineers. They'll write the code that like makes the app look like it does and puts a picture here and a button here. And in that example, like the back end engineers would be the ones who would say it's an app that 
provides you recommendations for something, they would implement whatever process does that. Um, it'll also, they'll also build the pipelines that'll like track user information as they're using the app and have that data come back to us. So engineers can um, do like a, like a wide, they are touching a lot of different areas usually in a company. Um, it's also not unusual for an engineering team to scale data science projects. So for example, say that I build this model that like predicts whether a customer is gonna make a purchase. I could then package that and give that to an engineering team and they'll like implement it on every single customer. So sometimes they'll help you handle some of that scaling, especially when you're working with larger amounts of data. Um, but again, it really depends on the different companies. Marketing is another team um, that at least I personally have worked with, but data science off, often supports. So a marketing team would be a team that are out designing ad campaigns, figuring out how to promote a project or a product. And you might support them in figuring out like maybe they want to launch a targeted advertisement, advertising campaign. So that would be a project where they would come to you and say, let's look at all of our consumer and our ad data, figure out how we can go about targeting different groups of people in a way that will lead to more sales or more interactions with our advertisements. Um, the finance team is another team that comes up a lot because obviously they're in charge of figuring out budgets and allocating money. So if you can help them predict what sales will be like or predict, you know, internally, like what team's budgets are going to be, how much they're going to spend. Um, usually they'll consult data science to get a sense of some of those numbers when they're establishing budgets, allocating money, all of that. Um, and then the product team is another team you'll interact with a lot. So consider the example of where you're looking, where you are um, working for that same phone application example. The product team's job is to understand the user experience and how to improve it and think about what other features that they can add to an app. So like think about um, like an app like Instagram, like a, a product that or a feature that they eventually added there was like the direct message option. Like way back, you couldn't send DMs on Instagram. So like the product team would be the team that'd be like, oh, you know what our users would really like is a way to private message people. How can we implement that? And I think of them a lot as like the, the conductor of the orchestra, because often to add these new features, you'll need engineering support, maybe like marketing to promote, hey, look, download the new version. And they're really in charge of organizing everybody and making sure that everyone knows what they need to do so that it all comes together to launch that new experience. And then the last team that I'll call out is um, what I call strategy and leadership. So you can think of them as like maybe C-suite, um, that sort of level, because a lot of the stuff that happens at that level is like figuring out what to prioritize, really thinking about like future directions of the business. So sometimes they'll ask, like for data science help in terms of just looking at historical data, like what has gone well already, what hasn't. Um, similar to like with the finance team, like predicting future sales and stuff that would all be helpful to that team. Um, and coming down from like the higher levels, you can also sometimes just get bigger questions as well. Um, that can be a little challenging in terms of figuring out how to quantify them of like, okay, how can we uh, make retention better or something like would be an example of a bigger question that you kind of have to narrow down a bit. Um, but that would come through just conversations with these different teams. Okay, so now a few of the skills that I have necessary here with an asterisk just because I always hesitate to say like, you definitely need X, Y, and Z to work as a data scientist. What's on this slide will give is like a good foundation that you could do at the intro level, but like some, there are jobs out there that do require like more specialized skills. 
So for example, sometimes companies, like if they have a particular team or project that they know they need to bring a new hire on for, they might, if it's something where you're looking at language modeling, for example, like you might need to have like specialized experience in what's called NLP or natural lang language processing. Um, so this won't be get your foot in the door for every single position, but it's definitely a good place to start. And if this is something you're interested in and you're choosing classes or just figuring out what to study um, using whatever materials you want, this is a good place to start. So for coding, um, I would say that pretty much 99.9% .9 of data science jobs, you will need to know some level of coding. Um, there are a few where you might be able to get away with doing things in Excel and um, like I've got nothing against Excel. I literally know nothing to do with it. So the people who can whip out the pivot tables and all of that, I'm always like very in awe of. Um, but that does that typically isn't how at least most companies when they call someone a data scientist, it's not so much in the Excel. Um, so for coding languages, um, SQL or what all people pronounce SQL is a database querying language. So whenever, like we keep all of our data in these big virtual computers that we then want to like select some of it, we'll use SQL because you can choose like what columns you wanna get. You can filter on different values. Maybe I only want like to look at customers who are men over the age of 20, for example. I could write um, in SQL a query that'll do that. And this is an area I found that I didn't really learn at all in school. Um, I personally did like a Khan Academy class and then it was kind of trial by fire when I needed it in an internship that I learned a lot. Um, so it's definitely something that's great to get exposure to um, if you can. And then typically what I'll see is either Python or R are the languages that most companies will use. Um, you might occasionally see some Java. I personally never have, but I know it's out there. Um, and with Python and R, knowing some of like the, from, there's a few packages in there and packages again are those thing, um, those that pre-written code that you can use to like fit a model or an algorithm or do different things. Um, I would also recommend looking up like data science packages in Python to know there's a set that'll come up a lot um, that are pretty common for people to use in industry. On the math and stats side of things, so a few courses or like the equivalent of courses um, that are good to know is first of all, just like in what you would cover in an intro stats course. So that's stuff like, um, like the student T test, you know, the one-sided, two-sided test, confidence intervals, um, linear regression, logistic regression, that sort of stuff. Um, it's not something that necessarily you'll use every day, but um, I definitely have like, I'll even, I'll still do like those sorts of tests. Um, so it's something good to know. A probability course is great. So that would be a course where you're learning about the different types of distributions that are out there, different properties of probability. Um, and typically for a probability course, I'd say, I'm trying to remember, it's been a few years, but I wanna say you, I like needed like a certain level of calculus and like linear algebra or something beforehand. And again, that's not to say that like, you need to be taking all of the courses of like the equivalent of an of a math or a statistics concentration. Um, I know a lot of people I've worked with that I went to grad school with also just like learn some of this on their own or through their own research when they had to apply it. Um, other courses are math stats. That one is, um, again, is a little bit more theoretical. So one of the big things I think that's important about data science is it can be pretty easy to pick up the coding side of things and be able to fit some really complicated models. But it's also easy to tell when someone can fit those models, but don't necessarily understand what they're actually doing. 
So like the course is like probability and math stat, like you want to be, you want to understand like when you fit a model, especially if you're going to help like give that output to somebody else and say, Hey, like you should base your strategy on that. You just want to make sure you understand what's happening theoretically and all the different assumptions and stuff that are involved. So that's why those, that's why these courses are here. Um, and then a machine learning course. So that'll cover a lot of different classification models. Um, just also different, like just a bunch of different models and algorithms that you can use. So some will predict values. Some will be what's called unsupervised where you don't actually know an outcome. So for example, a if I say supervised learning, I could be predicting like how much each customer is going to spend next week. And I'll find that out next week. I'll know versus with an unsupervised learning situation, there's no labels that we're trying to predict. So what that typically looks like is we're, tr you're trying to like, that's basically almost all like clustering techniques. If you've heard of clustering, um, where it's looking at combining groups of really similar observations. So a machine learning course will teach you all the different models and ways that you can accomplish those two tasks. And then lastly, I'll end with um, communication here. I'll say that this is something that gets overlooked so much because people, um, especially in data science, I think can tend tend to get caught up in like learning the latest coolest coding technique or the coolest model. Like when you think, when companies talk about their data science, they always talk about being cutting edge and all of that and innovative. But communication is so important when it comes to project management. So what I mean by that is like that process of working with your stakeholders. Like I, for example, I can't go into a meeting and say, okay, I fit this random forest model and optimize this loss function, like using this particular algorithm and start throwing jargon because like eyes are gonna glaze over, they're not gonna care. Um, so it's, you have to figure out how to talk about what you do, what might, which can oftentimes be technical and complicated in a way that they can understand they're not gonna understand like exactly how your models fit, but they need to at least have an idea of what you're doing so that you can build that trust in that relationship. Because if someone comes to me and says, I have these numbers, now go use them, but don't tell me, like, I don't know where they came from. So this com communication is a huge part. Like I said, that it's not as, and I hate to use this word to describe data science, it's not as sexy as the modeling and the coding but it's just as important. All right, so then looking at like what a typical or- um, Sorry to interrupt, we have a quick question that's in, yeah. the, in the chat. Um, if you okay. wanna check that. I know like when you're sharing your screen, you don't like see anything. So I just wanted to- Yes, I will look at that now because actually, I asked that question. You can also um, respond to it in the end if you prefer that. Okay, so no, we can do it now. It's just, I guess, when I have it like the. I can I just can quickly read it. I can read it out loud, or, or Annie can read it out loud. If yeah, I... it's basically oh. my, my question was um, regarding coding languages, whether you think it's more valuable to be kind of broadly familiar with different coding languages or to be very, very good in one, like to be a wizard in Python, but only just like fairly familiar with R and mm -hmm. SQL. Sure. Yeah, so I'd say like SQL is definitely like something that you need to be very familiar with. Um, I was trying to think when I was making this of like you have, you can know Python or you can know R. There really isn't like that database querying in, uh, language besides SQL that people really use. So I'd say SQL like definitely is something that you should learn and expose yourself to. For the Python versus R. So with this, um, that'll, 
I'll say that I like, I personally think if you know one of these really well, it's not as hard to pick up the other. So like, for example, I mostly, I learned R, that's what our undergrad taught um, in the stats courses. So that's what I learned first. And a lot of coding is just learning how to think like a computer scientist. Like it's a way of applying logic. Um, so when I got to a point where I needed to use Python instead, like, yes, it took a little bit to learn, but a lot of the same like things I had been doing in R, like you could do in Python as well. You just have to look up like, for example, R uses a lots of lots of parentheses and like different brackets where Python would use a colon. So I would say personally, like knowing one really well, I think, again, this is my opinion, um, knowing one really well as opposed to being like medium and both would be better just because like, if you know one really well, that also means that you've trained yourself in like thinking like that computer scientist and thinking like, it's definitely a different mindset in term when you're coding of just like how you think, how you go about looking for errors. Um, and in my opinion too, like say if I was on a team that wrote in Python and we bring someone in who's brilliant, but only knows R, like unless I need someone day one to hop in and start writing Python, like by knowing one language well, you demonstrate, like I was saying, you understand how to think in that way to code that oftentimes companies will like, can be okay with you then like picking up the other language when you first start. Um, I'm not gonna say always, cause there are cases where they literally need someone in in two weeks to like jump into this project ahead of time. But I would say in the beginning, definitely like focus on learning one very well. And then if you wanna learn more, great, but definitely make sure you know one of those very well. Thank you. Yeah. Just, okay. Pulling up the chat so it's not hidden. There we go. Okay, so career paths. Um, career paths here are these two, um, management versus individual contributor. You're also, you'll also see in a lot of different industries. I'm gonna talk about what they look like in data science or basically like what it looks like from starting as early as a data scientist moving along. So the first role I have here is data analyst and that has that dotted line. So um, one way that somebody who may not have all of those skills that I was talking about on the previous slide, some like sometimes pe what people do instead of trying to learn all of that on their own or apply straight for data scientist jobs is they'll start off as a data analyst. Um, a data analyst is typically someone who a lot of your work will be building different reports. So um, like taking in, I don't know, say they need like a weekly sales report or something. So you would design that. You're still working with data, but you might not necessarily be doing like that adv as advanced level of modeling. Um, and I have this here because for people who don't have necessarily all the skills that companies are looking for to jump right into data science, oftentimes a data analyst will work like within or adjacent to the data science team. And some people will use that as a stepping stone of your getting hands-on experience, but you can also learn like more advanced modeling and stuff just from like being next to the data science team. So don't feel like you have to necessarily learn everything because that can definitely be overwhelming as well. And just know that this is potentially another option as well. Um, and it helps you get like hands-on real world experience if you wanna call it that. Um, so that's just why I have that there with sort of the dotted line, cause it's an option. Looking at data science roles. So typically at companies, they'll either have two or three levels under data science. So the first will be like a junior or associate level that's typically somebody who is like coming straight out of school. Um, 
doesn't have as much experience or I've even seen companies it's like only if you only have one to two years experience again this will vary a lot by company like when I my first like my first data science job like I had the title data science. There were other companies I would have been a junior. There are other companies I would have been a senior. It very much depends on the different companies, but um, typically you'll see kind of these different levels within their organizations. Above the junior associate, you'll have someone with just the data science title. So that mid-level is someone who has a few years of work experience or, um, Sometimes if you come out with a graduate degree, you'll just, you'll jump to that mid-level right away. And this is somebody who they're probably not like leading things on their own or managing anybody, but um, they're pretty independent and don't necessarily need that level of guidance that someone right out of school would need. And then that once you progress to the senior level, that's somebody who can kind of lead projects on their own. They really don't need any intervention or um, like their manager can trust them that it's going to get done and maybe not have to check as much work. Um, so again, some companies will have two levels, some will have three, but that's the sense of what happens at each of those levels. And once you get to this point is where you have to start thinking about, okay, what way do I want to go? So you have your management track. So like the name implies these are roles where you're going to be managing people you have direct reports or a team that you're leading so you're a lot of your job is now going to involve like mentoring and career development making sure that the people under you are doing what they're supposed to and everything's going smoothly you'll also tend to be in a lot more meetings because you'll have a say in different strategies and prioritizing projects so for example, like the head of my team spends a lot of time in meetings just figuring out, okay, here's what everybody in the office needs from us, but like what's highest priority based on our current like team size and resources, like what can we actually get after? Um, so management, you'll still spend some time coding and fitting models, but you're going to spend a majority of your time usually in like different meetings and helping people and um, leading that way as opposed to being more in the weeds writing code. And if you're within an organization, like that'll be titles like manager, director, VP are typically indicative of like people who are more on that management track. On the other hand, um, you have the individual contributor road. So this is someone who is more project focused. They typically don't have anyone reporting to them, but they're happiest just, um, they're happiest like working on their own project. They're gonna still spend most of their day writing code, fitting models, all of that. Um, and typically they'll have titles like lead or expert. And one track isn't inherently better than the other. It's really just a matter of what do you enjoy doing? So like, if you wanna be a mentor, lead a team that management tracks more for you. If you find that you like kind of doing that research, writing code, really just um, doing like more of the stuff related to your own individual project, that tends to, who, that tends to be who ends up on the individual contributor track. And again, it's not like once you pick one, it's set in stone. Like I know many people who have tried one didn't really like it, went to the other and loved it. Um, this is just to give you a sense of like, what does a career in data science look like? And I included here at the bottom. So this product, 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 project marketing and engineering as sort of like adjacent options. So I know people who have started in data science and then transitioned into like product or project management because Remember I said earlier, the product team is really the conductor who's coordinating all of these different often technical teams and they were that type of work really appealed to them. So a lot of people too will move into like, if you love coding, some of the, some data scientists will transition to being just like pure software engineers. It's where they're writing code most of the day and not really 
and not doing any of the modeling or anything like that anymore. So again, this is just an example of what a path might look like. And I will say like data science is still a relatively new career. So this could also change a lot in the next five years as technology changes. Okay, so then the last thing, um, just in terms of talking about what is data science, um, I know someone had asked a question just about different places I've worked and is one better than the other. So my personal experience, so um, I've done some just like independent one-off consulting gigs, worked at a really small, like more startup type company, as well as a very large established company. And there are a lot of um, people will often ask, like, is it better to work at one versus the other? And like everything, there's pros and cons and trade-offs. So I'll just talk a little bit more about like in detail what those are. So the startup path, a lot of the pros with that is, um, I say here, you get to wear, wear many hats and there tends to be an opportunity for quick advancement. So what I mean by that is say you are, maybe you're hired as a data, data scientist at a startup, but there's only like 12 to 15 people at the whole company. Sometimes things are gonna, are gonna come up that aren't data science related, but somebody needs to do. So even though you might wanna build models, they might need somebody to help build out a database and you might have to just jump in on that to help out with that. So you can learn a lot but that can often be like, uh, you're just kind of thrown into the deep end because it's a new company, you're trying to get things off the ground. So again, you can learn a lot, but um, I'll talk about some of the cons of that in the next section, but that's what I just mean by the, the wear many hats. And then the opportunity for quick advancement. So if you're one of the first employees at a startup, um, oftentimes you can just like, okay, maybe I've been a data scientist here for a year, they don't necessarily have as much structure in terms of like what different levels mean. And you can just like become a senior data scientist because you asked or you've been there the longest. So then you become like the manager when other people come on or something. So um, that's what I mean by quick advancement because you're learning all those different skills as well. You can make your case. And if there's not other people to compare you to, it can sometimes be easy to just get like some of those title changes. And then it can also be easy to make a major impact. So what I mean by that is that um, if it's a very new company, they might not even have a marketing plan. So you can do all that data science work on the to figure out, okay, here's how we're gonna do a targeted marketing, marketing approach. There's a lot of projects that are gonna be a blank slate for you. And you'll be able, you can be able to see the impact that your work has, like, in a big way pretty easily. On the con side of the startup, so especially in the early stages, but um, it's definitely less stable. So personally, my first job where I was in a startup environment, I think it was five or six months and then started to go under and they laid a bunch of us off. So that's not unusual. Startups are usually constantly raising money for funding. So, um, that's just something to keep in mind. There can also be a lack of structure at times. So usually um, in the beginning of a startup, you're just constantly working to kind of keep your head above water, um, make sales or whatever it is. And they don't necessarily have as much of a formal structure in terms of like mentoring or even onboarding sometimes. Um, so again, that's not the case in every every startup, but that's just something to keep in mind. And then you can also sometimes have less predictable working hours that can be longer. So again, the early stages, it's just, you're really trying to keep, the whole company is like trying to keep things afloat, make sure money's still coming in. So um, there might be times where you're working weekends or after, you know, 5 p.m. or whatever. Um, so again, not necessarily the worst thing in the world if you, if you enjoy that, but just another thing to keep in mind. And then on the other side with the corporations or an established company. So typically that does bring more stability. 
Um, I feel like I should put a little asterisk on that with the year that we're having. But again, they're usually like they're established, they're well known. So if like I'm sure on LinkedIn you've seen people in their bio will put like former Amazon or former something like that's just what I mean by well known. Like they've proved that they've been successful. Um, you'll also get more structure. So I always think of my like my friends who went into consulting after graduation. Like a lot of those big consulting firms have like a very clear, okay, in two years, you'll go from this title to this title. And then in two years, it'll be this. So um, again, I'm not, not every single, I've seen big corporations that are just like a hot mess in terms of promotions and advancement, but typically because they've been around longer, they'll tend to have just more structure and clarity around that process. Um, that also leads to our first con is sometimes there can be a rigid timeline for promotion where if you're at one of these places where it's okay in two years if you're doing well like you'll get vote you'll get bumped up to this title maybe you just go out and crush it your first year it can be really hard sometimes to get an exception to those um, another thing is bureaucracy so the bigger your company gets that usually means that there's a lot more approvals that need to be sought out um, and can sometimes slow down projects and then lastly, it can be harder to stand out. Um, just if you're, I mean this more so like compared to a, a startup, because um, if you're already working on a project, say, let's go back to that marketing example, they already have an established strategy. It can be harder to do work that'll change that um, just because everything has been so established and people might be resistant to change. Again, I'm not saying it can't happen, but it is a little bit easier in a startup environment because the company's newer and you can be working on things that just haven't been done at the company before. Okay, so that covered like a very somewhat in detail about what is data science? What do the careers look like? What skills do you need? So for the second part, I'm gonna talk about actually becoming a data scientist. Um, this will talk about like some of the places you can learn some of those skills I talked about. Also touch on the interview process a little bit as well. So acquiring the skills. So I think of like three different areas where you can do this. First off, it's just like your traditional university courses. So you specifically go take some of these math classes or these stats classes or a comp sci course. Um, they can be great because it's all planned out for you. There are assignments, there are exams. You're usually motivated to do well, so you get a good grade. Um, it's definitely not the only way. As I said earlier, like a lot of my colleagues or people that um, were in my cohort in grad school, they didn't all come from like math and statistics backgrounds. Um, I think we had like a net, like someone who studied in like environmental science, like there's a lot of different ways you can get this knowledge too. Um, one way of some people will do is they'll take a data science boot camp. So I personally have haven't taken a boot camp and I'm not super familiar with them. What I will say that is if you're going to enroll in a boot camp that you're gonna, it's telling you, you can learn every single thing that I had on that previous slide in six weeks. That's probably not gonna happen. Um, so just really, again, I wish I had more knowledge of an experience of boot camps to share, but just like be aware. Cause I, I do suspect that some of these might be like, they'll teach you all, like I was saying before, like you'll be able to code all of these models and algorithms, but probably don't get into as much detail on like the math and theory underneath it about why it works and what it's actually doing. So again, like it can be a good source, but if you're thinking about that route, I'd say definitely like try to reach out to people who you can see on LinkedIn have done it um, or even recruiters can be a great source. Cause they'll like, um, if you know anybody who works as a recruiter, they'll know like, okay, this company, like, if they see a boot camp, like what do they think about that? Or is there a certain one that they value more than another? And then the 
last way is self-instruction. So I say self-instruction here. I just mean that you go and you get a book on a particular topic and read through it. Or honestly, there are so many great like online tutorials now that you can learn a lot of the stuff that like was in that skill slide just online by going through different either YouTube videos or things like that. Um, so again, like the self-instruction is a great way. I've definitely learned things I didn't learn in school by just reading articles and blogs. Um, and it can be a great method, usually cheaper than the university or the boot camp as well. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of resources too that I recommend. Um, so the first book, Build a Career in Data Science. So that actually just came out this year, but it gives you a really good like overview on like more in depth of a lot of the stuff that I've covered tonight. You'll also, um, it also talks about like the different companies more in depth, like career progression, all of that stuff. Um, and it's the first book I've ever seen that covered. I like wish it was out five or so years ago, it would have been very helpful to read. Um, and then for more of like a math and stat books, these two yellow books are like my favorite books ever. And if anyone asks, oh, I wanna learn more about statistics and machine learning, where should I start? So I'll say that this, the one on the left, the introduction to statistical learning, that's a great book that will give you like a very high level introduction to a lot of popular machine learning models and the math behind them. It also has examples in R, like labs at the end of each chapter that will also teach you how to go through the different R code necessarily to fit everything. Um, that's a book that like you could definitely, like I'd say you could definitely read, like I'm trying to think, they might mention a little bit of calculus, but even if you don't necessarily have like a super rigorous background in math, like that's a potential place to start. The other book here, Elements of Statistical Learning. So it covers what's in the first book, but this goes like really, really into the detail of the math. Um, so I always recommend the introduction first. If you feel good about that, you wanna learn more, go on to the second one. Um, Cause that's something that's definitely like a lot more in depth. And um, if you're not as comfortable in math, the second one can get very overwhelming very quickly. It got overwhelming at times when we were using it in grad school. So just know like it's not impossible, but definitely like at a different level. And then I just threw up Khan Academy and Coursera because a lot of these sites will also have like, for example, Khan Academy, like that's how I learned like the different ways to use SQL. So these also have a lot of courses out there that can be like an introduction to Python or something. And I really like the video learning personally, just cause you can pause, rewind, like slow stuff down. Um, so these are some resources that I always recommend, but too, you can also like, there's so many blogs out there about the best data science books and all of that. Like there's definitely stuff I don't have on here as well. That would be helpful. Okay, so then really quickly, let's talk about the um, interview process. So I haven't interviewed in a while, um, but from when I've interviewed for um, both my positions over the past few years, the interview process tends to follow like this structure or something very similar. So usually you'll start with a phone screen Sometimes that is with someone in HR who knows nothing about data science and they'll hit you with the usual, okay, why do you wanna work for this company? What this position, um, tell me about this experience on your resume. Um, you'll also usually have a phone screen with someone who is on da the data science side. They might be your first one. You might not have one with HR at all. Um, I've had it both ways. And that phone screen is usually just a little bit more technical. So um, if I talk about fitting a certain type of model on my resume, they might say like, can you explain, like, explain that model to someone who's not technical just to test like 
okay, do you actually know the things that you're talking about on your resume? But again, it's usually like pretty high level. Why do you want to work here? They'll tell you about the position, about the team, um, talk through some of the experiences on your resume. From there, a big part of the interview process will, will be a take home analysis. So these, this is something that may, I think is currently like changing in industry is people's perceptions of them. Just because like, for example, some of the jobs I've applied to like these take home analyses have taken like six to eight hours. So what it will usually look like is you'll get like fake data that's similar to the type of stuff that the team works with. They'll ask you some questions or ask you to fit a model to predict something and you'll write the code to do it, write up a little bit, write up a summary and send it back to them. And with this, they're looking to see, okay, can you take these business questions, which might sometimes be a little bit open-ended and translate them into something quantitative that you can use your technical skills to solve. They're also looking at your code. Is it commented? Is it formatted nicely that we can see what's going on? Because a big part of working on a data science team is I have to write code that I can send to my coworker and is organized and commented so that they can follow and it's just not a big mess. Um, and then they're also looking at your communication skills here. How are you writing that summary? Sometimes they'll have you as part of the final interview come in and present on your take home. Um, so that's the type of stuff they're testing. I say that this I think might is slowly changing is that um, similar to other industries is like, if I'm spending six to eight hours of my time on this, like we're getting towards the like free labor sometimes um, situation and that maybe you gave me fake data, but this is a problem your team's trying to solve and you're gonna take my idea, but not hire me, for example. Like very bad companies will do that. Um, I'm not gonna say none of them do. And also there's the question of like, okay, if we require something that takes six to eight hours, not everybody we interview can do that. Like, for example, if you're a parent and you already have a full-time job, like requiring something like this, you might not be able to put as much time into it as someone who's not. Um, so there's still, it's still a big part of it, but I'm just throwing that in there because I wouldn't be surprised if we see this changing a bit to be um, for companies just using different ways to understand some of those skills that they're traditionally testing with this. And then from there, you'll typically go to a final round interview. Um, and the before times that was usually an onsite, but you'll meet most of the people on the team you're working with, the hiring, like all of those people you'll have one-on-one -on -one conversations with. Um, they'll sometimes you'll get more technical questions then. So like I've been asked, can you on the whiteboard, like write out the code for how you would do this algorithm, for example. Um, not every company will do that. Sometimes the take home is the extent of the technical questions, but the final round is just, you're meeting more people, um, really getting a sense of what it would be like to work there, have an opportunity to ask questions of them. Um, so that's what a typical interview process looks like. Um, again, I've also only interviewed for like mid-level and senior level positions. So at when you kind of get to the management or leadership level, this will probably look different, but um, this is the general structure of it. So then the last thing before um, get to the conclusion with some summary points and take some more of your questions, um, just some general advice. So I do get a lot of students and people who reach out to me who are interested in data science and when I was making this just thought about like, what are some of the things that I keep like saying to them over and over typically. So the first, and this, I mean, this, as you all probably know, is like also applies to just your professional life and career in general, but really invest time in building relationships. So like about once a week, I'll get an email or a LinkedIn message from a student that will literally just say, hi, I saw you work here in data science. I'm interested. Do you have internships? And 
like something like that is especially I feel like in data science is a lot of people who have data science on their profiles like get those types of messages every day the one that's the ones that stand out are the the students who like take the time to like learn a little bit more about you or like if you have for example like a blog post they'll read it and comment on it um so really invest that time to just make yourself stand out like take the extra five to ten minutes to do a little bit more research because including something like talking about the work that the persons did versus like a very obvious copy and paste like i'm trying to find a job message you'll get so many more responses on or more likely to get responses on that first one and i personally like hated network with every networking with every fiber of my being because in the beginning I also felt like that I had to that I was always coming to these networking sessions saying like oh can you answer these questions for me can you tell me this and it felt very one-sided but I will say that you you're establishing these relationships you're going to keep in touch with the people over time so you never know when it could be like very in, in the near future that you'll be able to help them so like for example i had someone i met at like a data science function that was very helpful in just like answering my questions and i was able to like a few months later had a friend that was working for an internship and was able to recommend them and i also had something to bring to the table so it's going to feel awkward at first, especially if you're new to a field, but put the time in to do that because you never know like down the line when you can help someone or when someone's be able to help you. Another thing is to create a portfolio website. So um, at the end of this, I'll have a link to my personal website that's essentially still a portfolio website. And this is because a lot of students I find will say that they're having trouble like getting their foot in the door because companies are saying, I don't have enough experience, but I can't get any experience if no one hires me. So a portfolio website can be a really powerful tool to show companies that sure, maybe you didn't work, like maybe you didn't have an internship in a relevant field or you don't have any work experience, but you can still highlight the different skills that you have so say you take a stats course and you have a project at the end of the semester that it's take this data and make a presentation on it. Like that's an example of something that you would then put on your portfolio website to say, hey, look, here's the code I wrote. Here's that interesting story that I found in the data and here's how I found it. And it's presented in like a very nice professional looking way. There are a bunch of free tools out there that you can do like drag and drop websites. That's personally what I do. I will say this is also great for when I was interviewing for my first positions and usually all that I had to talk about was the different projects I had worked on in school. And when I would send like a follow up oh thank you for meeting me if they were particularly interested in a project, you could just send the link to that from your website. And it's just like a nice little way to like highlight yourself again after the fact so always recommend that um, students put this together because it can also be a great way to like I had projects on here that I had done like a year or two before I interviewed so it was great when I was setting this up to also get a refresher of some stuff I'd done in the past and then lastly I'll say don't forget the non-technical skills like I said before people get caught up in learning all the different state-of-the-art models and coding techniques but at the end of the day, you still need to be able to talk about what you do, the value you bring to the table, and be able to share that with people who don't have that same technical background as well. You need to establish that relationship with them. Um, so again, like definitely just don't sleep on those. Um, and with that, I'll just go to a quick conclusion. So a few points that I just wanted to reiterate. Um, one, data science, it's a blend of math and statistics, coding, as well as those communication skills. So um, kind of your foot in a few different camps. 
And data wrangling, the feature generation, takes a lot, a lot of time. I know that was a brief point for this to be included in the summary, but I just think it's important to, again, oftentimes people think as data science as you're always doing these cool machine learning stuff, but at the end of the day, a lot of it is can be this frustrating data cleaning work. And then lastly, there are many paths to becoming a data scientist. So if this is something you're really interested in, but you feel like, oh no, I haven't taken like any of these courses at all, what am I gonna do? Just know that there are different ways to do that. And I think because data science is still a relatively new field, like for example, like three, four years ago, there were very few schools that offered programs in data science. So there are a lot of people who don't necessarily follow like what you would think of as a traditional path into this field of, you know, math, statistics, computer science in school, and then going to this. So just don't get discouraged. Um, and like I was saying, like, look at some of those resources I mentioned earlier, because that you don't have to go and get the degree necessarily. There are other ways to get to that goal. And with that, I'll open to questions. So this website here, I was saying, if you're interested in looking at like an example of what I mean by portfolio website, you can check that out. And then I also have my Twitter up here. So I'm fairly new to Twitter, but I'm gonna start like posting more about like data science and answering questions about how to become a data scientist and stuff like that. Um, also, if you think of questions after this that you want answered, feel free to, um, you can send me a message through my website or also DM me on Twitter. I'm happy to answer them, but I will take any questions that you guys have now that I may not have covered. quick question. Sure. Um, so for SQL, how, like, how do you learn it without just doing lots of trial examples? Because it seems like the kind of thing that's like, it's useful for something else. And then with the type of data analysis that we're usually doing, either like just like a simple filter in R or something can, can get you what you need. Um, so is there a way to, to learn it? Or is it, it literally just like, here's the question, like, how would you, like, what's the syntax in order to execute the answer? Yeah, so that for sure, I don't, I took it many years ago. I imagine it's still on Khan Academy. So for something like SQL, because like, definitely that's true. Like I didn't need SQL because I wasn't working with large data until I was working in industry. So looking at like a Khan Academy, or I'm assuming there's gonna, there's probably more tutorials out there now, that'll give you a really good introduction. And oftentimes they'll have examples and like, I keep saying the Khan Academy example, but when I did it, they had an environment where you could practice queries on data sets and see what happened. So that's a great place to learn like the syntax of it. So like how you actually do those different, like what text you have to write to do those things. They'll also cover the different types of joins. So um, how you join like two tables based on values that are in each of those tables, that's a big thing that comes up with SQL. Um, and then also some of the aggregate functions will be covered in that. So like how you find averages and like group by different variables. So I would say start going through a course like that. And then, um, I, oh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. But if you Google like SQL interview questions, you'll sometimes just like find lists of questions that are commonly asked and are usually pretty indicative of like the type of work that you would need SQL for. But they'll also have, again, that practice environment. So you can like even just make up questions yourself of, okay, maybe I have a database that has information about every single item a customer has bought all right, how do I take that and get to a table that has for each customer, like the first date they bought something, the average price, the number of items they've bought. Just like think about different questions like that as well. But there's so much that's come online also in the past few years that will give you example questions like that. Because when I was interviewing, like a typical SQL question would be, okay, you have a table with this, 
with a table with this, here's what the variables are. How do I end up with like, usually involves some joining and summarizing. And they're like, what query would you use to get, you know, the average price of something? Um, and you should know the actual like syntax words, not like so much of coding is knowing how to Google, right? So it's like, how much is it you should actually know off the top of your head mm -hmm. versus know like that exists and I can figure out how to figure that out. Yeah, so I'll say that depends a lot. Like I find that SQL, they tend to be a little bit more like, okay, I'm gonna ask you how to do this. like just because the, the syntax tends to be a little bit easier and that like there are different words you can use like an asterisk versus if you think about coding in Python and R, it's like, do I really need to know like all of the different brackets and stuff when a lot of the coding environments will autofill them? Um, I will say that like, I do find that most companies, it's like, it's pretty easy to tell if you know what you're doing so, okay, maybe I like forgot a semicolon or something at the end of my SQL command. That's not a huge deal. As long as you can demonstrate the logic, that's not, there will be some companies that are like, no, this is wrong. And like, wait for you to fix the syntax. But for me personally, I was like, I'm in that second, I'm okay. This is not the environment that I want to work in then. Cause like you were saying, I literally have like five stack overflow tabs open at almost all times. Like it's more of like, make sure you understand the logic and the steps you need. Um, that's more important for sure. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. First, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, how would you like advise us people in academia to sell ourselves to these jobs if we have the technical skills, but we don't have any formal sort of training or anything like on our CV that shows we have those skills, since most of our projects are usually oriented towards, um, you know, publications or like creation of like some kind of like knowledge base, but not necessarily like, um, you know, a more like tangible project of mm -hmm. some sort. Yeah. Um, so I'll say too, um, with that, like a lot of students will do what are called like Kaggle competitions. So if you're not familiar, it's a website where usually it's companies um, will post data and some questions on it. So I think like early days, Netflix like posted some of their data and was like, build a record, like how should we recommend movies, like build a model to do that. So the, those are like competitions where you can like measure your performance against other people. Um, that's pretty well known in data science. Like, so you can do some, like try some of those out. And even if you don't win, cause there are like some people who spend so much crazy time on that, but you now have like that more concrete example of, okay, here is some, it's probably gonna be messy data that I was using. Here's the question that, that was asked of it. And here's what I did, why it's important, why it matters, because you just want, you just need to show evidence of being able to apply those technical skills to something, getting a result and communicating it back. Um, so like you said, you might not be doing that in your, the projects you're doing now. So I'd say look for opportunities that you can like just demonstrate that. Cause I think by like show, by being in this program and especially the area that it's in, like you show that you're, resilient and can do research because like grad school is not easy and it takes a long time it can be frustrating um i think also like the communication is going to be different like highlight that you're probably a bit farther along in that area compared to somebody not to throw stereotypes around but, like statistics department isn't always the most outgoing so like i would say then like you were saying like find those opportunities whether it be through kaggle or even, um, I think it was, there was a UCAL school that has like a machine learning repository. There's just literally a ton of data sets you can download for free and just like play around with some data sets, find an interesting story and write about it. Um, so just, and if you can, like, if you end up doing something that's um, 
school related that involves data, like that's also great. But if you don't have that opportunity, it's just basically think about how you can just do it yourself by finding data sources and asking questions about them and coding to get the answers. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. I had a question about um, like how, I guess like larger companies you might be, um, oh yeah, sorry, friend, hey, thanks so much for like sharing your experience, it was super helpful. <laughs> um, at larger companies, you might be like just working on one type of like machine learning problem or like one type of problem in general, I guess, like advertising, let's say. I guess, how do you go about finding like how companies value like you working on different problems versus just being kind of like stuck on one like what are the best ways to approach that in terms of like how much independence you have in the projects you're working on and yeah I was wondering if you could take a little more to that mm -hmm. yeah so I'd say a lot of that will come out of like asking about in the interview process so like asking even like this is something I would usually ask early on is like okay what does a typical day look like for someone on this team? What are the teams outside of data scientists that you're working out of data science that you're working closely with? If the answer is only one team or none, that's probably more indicative of, okay, you're gonna be a bit more siloed into this like niche area um, is one just one thing to keep in mind. Um, I'll, I'm trying to think of other questions I'll ask too is like, um that's so that's definitely the biggest one also like you'll most if i mean when you're interviewing you should be talking to your potential future manager if your future manager doesn't interview that's a red flag but i would also always ask about like their managing style like for example the roles i've had i've had managers who it's like I like to give, like, they like to give people a little bit of freedom and that they're not going to say, okay, you need to fit this model in this way and like be very prescriptive. So I think asking questions, not only the manager, but also the other people on the team, right? Cause they'll like, they'll probably be like the manager might think they manage one way, but in reality it's not. So you just want like get that diversity of opinions. And two, just from asking them questions about like what they're currently working on. So I'll usually try to ask um, to explain like obviously what they're allowed to say publicly or in an interview, like what sort of thing you're working on and also like what's the favorite project or biggest accomplishment they've had on the team so far. Because then you'll get a sense of like what different areas they work in and if it seems to be only one area, um, that'll, that can give you a sense of that as well. And then do you feel like it's, I guess, is it advantageous to work on a team that has more flexibility with projects or do you think it's okay to be kind of like siloed if you are? I mean, I guess at larger companies it probably might happen that way just because of the structure, but do you think there is an ad, like, is it advantageous to work on teams that might have more flexible, like flexibility yeah, I, problems I, to solve? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it honestly really depends on what you like to do. So if you work in more of like that siloed area, it's more likely you're going to get like very, like you're going to get a lot of knowledge in that one area. Um, so say for like, say for example, like you're only working for marketing, like you'll learn a lot about retention, targeted advertising, like all of these specific areas, which like if you're really passionate about that area can be great. Um, even if you're not, like you're still gonna learn stuff about applying statistics and in industry and working with people who aren't data science, like you're still gonna learn a lot. Like on the other side of things, if you're working with a bunch of different teams, like for me, I personally just prefer that because like my personality is if I'm only doing that one thing forever and I get stuck, like I lose, so, like so much motivation so fast like I personally like being able to jump around more so of like 
that's my personality. That's how I work best. I like to just do different things and change it up a lot. Um, when you do that also, like you will get more exposure within the company and meet more people. So that could be an advantage, but I think it really depends on like what you like with working. Um, same with, in terms of like a manager, if it can be helpful, like, especially if you're starting out early, like your first data science job to have someone above you tell you like, here's exactly what you need to do to get this done. Um, just cause it can be like, I was very overwhelmed my first job. Cause I was like, you know, I literally was just in school and now you're trusting me to make this decision. Okay. And like figured it out, but that can be helpful. And like, if you know, like you need that sort of structure and that's, what's going to help you develop skills. Like that's great. For me, I like having the freedom to explore a little bit, think like, what do I think would be the best way to do it? And then kind of have, I'll go to my manager and be like, okay, here's my plan of attack and we'll talk about it. Um, so again, like each has its advantages and disadvantages because I could come out with something and they're like, what are you doing? That makes no sense. Um, so I think a lot of it depends on like how you work best and what level of structure it is that you're interested in. Thanks. Um, okay, so if there's not any other questions, I can't tell if you're talking, Liz, or is your mouth just moving? Uh, something was weird with my headphones. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. I was like, she looks like she's talking, um, she's not muted. So just, I was wondering, you use the term feature generation and I was able to look that up and, and figure out the gist, but I was just curious, you gave all these nice resources and I was wondering if any of them um, kind of hits on that sort of lingo. Like if we're not picking that up in our school um where might we pick that up um that i'm not sure because i'll say like a term like feature gener like that should be used in some of those books that i mentioned and they'll probably define them i personally don't know off the top of my head like oh here's like a dictionary of common terms at all but like a lot of these introduction to data science like articles or books will will define them. Um, I think it's more of just like they'll come up like as you need to know them when you're learning about a specific area. Okay. Um, I say then if there aren't any more questions we can wrap here a few minutes early but like I was saying before definitely if like stuff comes up after the fact or that you just didn't want to ask in front of the whole group like feel free to either reach out to me through my website or through my Twitter um, I'll usually respond within um, a few days as those come in and I'm happy to answer other questions that way as well um, if you don't mind uh, a couple quick questions. Yeah. Um, first off, thanks so much for giving us this info session. I, I think we'll all find it really helpful as we're considering next steps for our own careers. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything that you found surprising about uh, jumping into a career in data science that you wouldn't have expected, um, even going through your various academic programs. And then also if there's anything that you don't like uh, about it that we should maybe be wary of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, um, I think on the surprising part, so from the projects I did in school, oftentimes we were like scraping data off the internet or just downloading data files from different websites. And a lot of those projects, like we had to do data cleaning. I feel like and I knew, like, I knew that was a big part of data science, but I still feel like getting to into industry 
was like surprised in some cases, like how much there still was. Um, just cause like, even though a company may have had data science for a while, a lot of times like things were set up, maybe not with data science in mind. So like I've been places where like tables live in a hundred different spots and you have to join them all together. Um, so just like, I think a lot of companies will be like, yes, we love data science. It's great, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, like don't necessarily always have the structure to support it. Um, so I think that's something that's surprising. And for me is like something that was annoying to have to deal with at first. Um, that's a big thing. And then I think another thing that I at least had to learn a lot about, and I think this is also just something like career-wise in general um, was like the importance of like promoting myself and advocating for myself. So I felt like I went in with the assumption of like, oh, like people love data science. It's this super cool career area that's being talked about so much. And like, I'll be on the data science team. Like people are going to know what I do. And that didn't necessarily have like my first company, for example, the one that failed, not surprisingly, like our CEO didn't even know why the data science team was there. So like having to figure out how to deal with that, I felt like was surprising to me just because it seemed to me like all of these companies that I interviewed with when we're recruiting were like, we love data science. It's so great. Um, I'd say that was a surprising thing. Um, and then th things that I don't like, um, I say there, there's some stuff around like, um, some, some of the processes can feel a bit tedious at times. So like, for example, when I'm writing code that I'm working on with the rest of my team, like we have a very like set rules about like, here's how you document it. Here's how you comment your code. Here's where like, you need to write a summary that goes here, that goes here and here. And that can just feel like a lot at times, um, even though like it's there so that we can work really, like we can work better together. But like some of that part, I just wanna be like, I just spent all this time writing this code and now I, you know, I just wanna move on to the next thing. And you sometimes have to slog through that documentation stuff a little bit, but um a lot of it, I feel like it's just like the necessary evil of things. Um, so I, I haven't come across anything yet that I'm like, wow, I really chose the wrong career. Like I do at the end of the day, like enjoy what I'm doing, but like with any job, you'll have some of those areas where it's not the most exciting stuff. Sorry, I have another question. What are some good questions to ask companies when thinking about like what type of data science teams they have and what, like how they use data science? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with that, I think it's a good, it's like a good sign if you are meeting with people who aren't only data scientists. So sometimes like even before you get to asking questions can be a good sign of like, if I go in and I interview with an engineering lead and a product lead and the data science team, like that tells me that they're invested because these are people who want to meet you and evaluate you as a potential employee. Um, I would like, if you end up like talking with HR, like ask HR like, oh, what do you see the role of data science as? Like what teams do they help out most? Like, cause if they can't even answer those basic questions, that's probably telling you that either, well, one, maybe you got someone in HR who's like, it's their first day, I don't know. But like asking people who aren't on the data science team, like how do you interact with them? How do they help you do your job better? And then when you're meeting with actual people on the team, ask for examples of like, can you give me an example of when like you, helped like another team like achieve a goal or something um try to get them to talk about projects where it's not just within data science that there's other people there and if 
like I, the ideal answer would be like, oh, well, we helped the marketing team figure out how to group customers and target ads better. And we saw an X percent increase in people clicking on ads, for example. Like that to me is like, that shows, okay, you're really invested in working with those other teams versus if you just get like a really vague example with not a lot of detail, like that's probably, maybe they don't actually like work with other people as much and have that investment from other teams. Okay. Um, so that seems like as good a place as any to leave it. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, and yeah, like she said, you have ways to be in touch if things, things come up. Hope everyone has a good evening. Um, thanks for coming. Cool, thank you. Bye.